Hey everybody, I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson and I'm a Professor Emeritus at UCLA and I'm also the Director of Education at Stevenson Dental Solutions here in San Dimas, California where we give courses to dentists on all types of different topics. Uh, I would like to talk to you today about porcelain veneers and this is part of our series, Five Things You Should Know About X. Today, porcelain veneers have been in dentistry for 50 years. I owe a huge thank you to one of dentistry's greats, John Calamia. And John Calamia from New York developed the methodology to take porcelain and bond it to tooth structure. Shout out to you, John. Thanks so much. Veneers can be beautiful, particularly in a case like this where a patient is an attorney but he's unable to feel confident in the courtroom and with clients because of his teeth. But with some simple preparations, the appropriate dental materials, and attention to detail, we can provide him with an amazing result like this and essentially change his life. But veneers are not that straightforward, really. Veneers take a lot of work. Veneers are the most difficult procedure that we do in dentistry. So let's talk about the five things you should know about course of veneers before you say yes to your dentist. And if you're a dentist, this actually might be educational for you if you're a little bit new to the veneer world. First of all, veneers are not reversible. Once they're placed, that's it. They can't be removed easily without destruction of tooth structure. Number two, they don't last forever. You know, that's a a funny thing, people think, oh, I got a crown on my tooth, that's going to last forever, right? And the answer is no, not at all. And we'll talk to you a little bit about how long veneers should last. Number three, they're not a cure for other smile-related problems. Like you want to have a better looking smile and you just think, well, veneers are the way to take care of that. It may not be true at all. There may be much simpler approaches to taking care of your smile needs. Number four, your bite. That's right, your bite, how you chew, how you function, how you parafunction is really critical. For long-term success, we have to have a stable bite. And then finally, this is the toughest one, I think. Your dentist needs to have special training. I taught at UCLA for 26 years, and we taught porcelain veneers as part of our curriculum. Even though we taught them, only a handful of students actually got to do them in the clinic on a real patient. So theoretically, dentists have a pretty good idea about how to do veneers, but in practical terms, this is uncharted territory for a lot of the clinicians that are trying to do good aesthetic dentistry. Let's tackle the first one. They are not reversible. Well, understand that in these veneer preparations you see across the screen here, these teeth have been altered. They have been shaped by the dentist. They have been shaped with a drill, tooth structure is removed, things have been smoothed, and about 95 to 100 percent of the time we have to alter tooth structure. Occasionally we can do a no prep veneer, but that's a rare situation. So tooth structure is removed and then these beautiful veneers are bonded to the teeth and they look amazing, right? But this is it. If they chip or crack or stain, they've got to be completely removed and then we have to remove tooth structure in the process. So let's remember that porcelain veneers are definitely not reversible. Also, they don't last forever. Why not? If they're done really well, you'd think they'd last forever. I mean, I've had a lot of dentistry in my own mouth. Why does it have to be replaced? I'm good at flossing and brushing. And the reality is, there's just too much stress on the teeth. There's the bite forces. There are the opportunity for bacteria to seep underneath the margins or the edges of the crowns. And things sometimes don't last forever. And that's really quite true when it comes to veneers. We use the word porcelain, but actually the word porcelain isn't really right. We should be using the word ceramic. And there's a difference between porcelain and ceramic. Let's put it this way. 
Porcelains are ceramics, but not all ceramics are porcelain. And let me explain. Over a hundred years ago, we started using porcelains to develop restorations for tea. We were able to make full crowns out of this porcelain material. And it took almost a hundred years for us to come up with something that was better than porcelain, or stronger anyway, to veneer teeth with. And so we evolved into newer materials, and those newer materials are incredibly strong and very predictable. But they have with them their own set of problems. So even though we progressed from porcelain to newer products, we still look back to porcelain as being perhaps the most beautiful of all choices. Today we have a lot of choices for veneers. Emacs is one of those choices. Emacs is a material that is made in a laboratory that is incredibly strong. It's about five times stronger than porcelain. And then we have another material called zirconia, which can also be used for veneers, which is about 20 times stronger than zirconia. In addition to Emacs and zirconia, we also have a product called Hylucite Ceramics, or Hylucite Glass Ceramics. And if we were to take all of these products and put them on a, a scale of strength, from the left-hand side porcelain, which you can see is only 80, all the way up to the zirconias, which can be well over 1,400 megapascals of flexural strength, and that's a big word. But basically, a megapascal is a unit of force that equals about 150 pounds per square inch. So we're talking about huge amounts of forces. But porcelain is very, very low over here. So porcelain is not by any means the strongest material that we have. If you look at the strength from left to right, you're looking at the felspathic porcelain they are used for veneers, but we also have other materials for veneers that are stronger and stronger and stronger. And we can end up with something like zirconia that is practically indestructible. But what's the problem when you get something that's stronger? The problem is it becomes less translucent. So you can see from this wavy line here that what we have is we have a translucency decrease as we increase in strength. So porcelain still remains the most translucent, which makes it usually the most beautiful veneer material that we have. It's very thin when it's made, but once it's bonded, it can be very, very strong, except at the edge. At the edge, it'll be more weak. So porcelain veneers are fantastic, but we should always consider, particularly if we're a grinder, or if we put a lot of force on our teeth, we ought to consider stronger materials like the high lucite or even the lithium bisilicate materials, and probably even in the most severe conditions, some kind of translucent zirconia. But for the best looking veneers, the ones that are the most customized to your needs, we're going to want to use 100% feldspathic porcelain. And today, it remains my favorite choice. I did my first case of veneers in 1986. I was a new graduate from UCLA. I was in private practice, and I made my very first veneer case. John Calamia would be impressed that a new graduate, only four years after his invention, was performing these procedures. So I've been doing these now for 36 years, and I can tell you, they are difficult, but they can be incredibly beautiful, particularly if we use a felspathic porcelain. When can we use felspathic porcelain versus when do we have to use something else? Well, that depends a lot on your dentist's decisions and your mouth, where, how it's functioning and how much stress is you're putting on your teeth. Like I said before, if you tend to be a grinder, you probably want to stick with the stronger materials. So, how long do veneers last? That was the question that I posed. We know they can't last forever. But if you look at cumulative survival rate in many different systematic reviews, and we look at the length of time that veneers last, we're looking at about 96% at 20 years or so. That's pretty good, but you have to understand something. These veneers in these studies were performed by highly trained dentists, dentists that had specialty training, dentists that were typically in academics. What we see far too often are failures. These are the types of failures that might happen with veneers. You can see we could have tissue failures because 
the tissue has, has become receded and you have a black triangle now. We have situations where we have decay underneath the veneers, maybe because of some leakage around the margins of those veneers. Uh, we see restoration failures like chips and fractures and debonding where veneers will crack and break through just normal function. They shouldn't be doing that. And then we can also see color changes, stained margins and darkening like you can see in this central incisor on the left hand side, how dark it's become as a result of leakage underneath the veneer because it wasn't performed properly. So we do have significant issues that can attack our veneers that will degrade our success rate. We have to also know that veneers are not a cure for other spinal issues. We need to be really mindful of the fact that we can't all have the perfect spine. If you're unrealistic in your expectation about what a veneer can do, this is doomed to fail. You have to see a reasonable improvement in your smile with veneers. You have to understand when they're indicated and when they're not indicated in order to see what veneers can do for you. But let's look at something in the way of maybe a conservative approach to smile design. Aesthetic analysis is critical. Your dentist cannot just say, oh, you look great, but veneers will make you look better. They need to take a little bit more of a careful, detailed approach to evaluate what's going on with your smile. Sometimes orthodontics is the only thing that's required. Or maybe bleaching. Or maybe some smoothing of some irregular edges. Or we could do composites, some white fillings to cover over some irregularities. And we only opt for veneers when really they're the last choice. Bleaching is phenomenal. And a lot of people give up on bleaching because they've tried it in the office only once and it doesn't really work. And then they get a home kit and that doesn't work. Or they have a lot of sensitivity. But there are a lot of ways at this time to mitigate these types of issues, to mitigate those problems. We can make bleaching at home work incredibly well for you. Ask your dentist about this as an option. So you look at a case like this, and there's just no way I would ever do veneers in this case. You would destroy too much tooth structure, and also your teeth would have to be really narrow to fit between the spaces. To make things look normal, this patient needs to go through orthodontics. Unresolved functional issues, in other words, how you're chewing, can be a major problem when it comes to veneers. Many studies have been completed which look at why veneers fail. And what this study found by Grinnell and his group was that if you have a patient that has a lot of existing fillings, or if they're a abruxer, in other words, they grind their teeth when they sleep or during the day through whatever reasons, for, what, for whatever reasons, uh, then they can have a significantly early failure rate. If we look at other studies, we can see the same thing come tr true. This is a Bayer study, and from Bayer, he found looking at 318 veneers that half of the patients that uh, were diagnosed in the study did have some type of bruxism, which may be the reason why we had only 82% success rate after 20 years. So if you do grind your teeth, does that mean you can't get veneers? Of course not. It just means that you need to be aware of what you need to do to stop those veneers from breaking. And then finally, we have to be aware of the fact that we're dealing with enamel that we want to bond to. If we don't have enough enamel, like you've got erosion around your gum line like this, or you've got receding gums like this, you're going to be at a greater risk for the veneers failing. Why do they fail here? They fail because they leak around those edges, they flex, they can break because they don't bond to entirely one substance, that being enamel. And we can see that bonding to enamel is a critical factor for survival. And then in this last study, we see that if we don't have adequate internal enamel, not just peripheral enamel, but the enamel that's on the inside where the veneer will be bonded, we also see a higher failure rate. 91% success rate at 10 years is not acceptable in my opinion. I mean, can you imagine if you had 10 veneers within 10 years, one would fail? That would be a horrible experience. You don't want that to happen at all. So failure rates will definitely increase when you try to bond the veneers to dentin 
and you don't have enough enamel remaining. So you can see that this requires a significant analysis of remaining tooth structure and a very careful decision between you and your dentist to make this call. Another contraindication is, gosh, when easier things will work. For example, this patient has a chip on his, on his left central incisor, which makes the incisor shorter, and it's been polished by a previous dentist, or this patient doesn't need a veneer, all they need is a simple bonding procedure. Bonding is a really simple, quick way to solve problems like this. We also have patients that have black triangles because perhaps genetically they're predisposed to recession or maybe they had a bout with gum disease and after it cured and it, it healed, the gums receded. And you can see areas like this where you have these black triangles. This is not necessarily a good veneer case. In fact, I would consider this to be a contraindication where you definitely don't want to have veneers because the problem in this patient is not the white stuff it's the pink stuff, right? So we talk about the white of dentistry, the beautiful white teeth, but we should also talk about the pink. So for me, it's the white and the pink that really matter. Now, there's no way to grow that gum back. There are some pretty elaborate procedures that we can try to try to bring back the gum, but when the bone is gone, the gum goes with it. So the only thing we have left to do to fill in a black triangle like this is to perform something that's really conservative and that involves performing a diagnostic wax up of all these little spaces you see. They're not just between the centrals, they're also between the lateral incisors on either side of the central incisors. And so what we do is we perform a diagnostic wax up and we evaluate, will this patient look better with these spaces filled? Can it be done with something simple? And here in this example, all we did was direct composite to fill in those spaces. No veneers were required. The direct composite did not require any drilling at all. It was laid in and bonded to the tooth structure. What a beautiful solution to a problem that had been plaguing this patient for a long time. And we have a beautiful resulting smile. There are good indications. I mean, one is right here for sure. We have teeth that are crooked that really could not be fixed with braces. We have a space between the teeth. We have an existing filling. We have short teeth that have maybe become shorter over lifetime of the patient because of wear. This is a beautiful indication for four veneers, not six, eight, or ten, or eight veneers, but just four veneers. And we have a really natural appearance for a patient that's in her 50s that made sense for her to follow this particular color and this shape size. There are really good indications when you have fractures like this. Could you do a direct composite here? Absolutely. Can we, in other words, can we do bonding? Can we lay down the bonding and make these teeth look normal? Absolutely. But these teeth both needed root canals because this patient fell off of a scooter and their teeth became devitalized. They needed root canals. And so we wanted something that was going to be stronger and wrap around the edge a little bit more. And for that reason, we, ate, we did veneers. And you can see that when you do veneers, the teeth become a little smaller, right? You have to take away some tooth structure before you add tooth structure. But we were able to add tooth structure. This is immediately after they were placed, so the patient has a little bit of bleeding there in the middle. But after about three days, that heals up. They look fantastic. But this was a really good solution for this patient's particular fractured problem. And they look terrific. Let's take a look at that bite issue a little bit more closely because a stable bite is key for success. And unfortunately in dental school, and I, you know, as being a professor in dental school for, for 26 years, I can tell you that there's a lot of confusion in the area of occlusion. We call it nathology and occlusion, or uh, understanding the balance of the bite and understanding the functionality of the bite, all of those things are taught in dental schools, but they're taught with a lot of confusion and controversy. And I can tell you that having a stable bite is one of the keys to success in dentistry. Your bite on your back teeth will help support your front teeth, and the front teeth will need to be designed to avoid chewing interferences. Otherwise, while you're chewing, what can happen is you can get chipping, you can get fractures, your teeth can move apart, you can get loose teeth, or you can get temporomandibular joint problems, also called TMD. So we want to be really careful whenever we introduce front teeth 
into the patient's bite that they don't cause issues that could lead to chipping and pain and spacing, et cetera. And that requires a lot of analysis. This is an example right here of a patient that had veneers at an office about six months before this young man came to see me because he was confused, why did my front teeth chip like this? I just got these veneers less than six months ago. And when I evaluated him carefully, it was very clear that the length of the veneers and the width of the veneers was interfering, not with his bite when his teeth were closed, but while he was chewing. So we perform a very sophisticated test called a chew test to make sure that when this patient's chewing, that the new veneers would not be subject to this type of fracture. And then finally, a veneer guard is essential. I don't call it a night guard. It is not for bruxism necessarily. It's made to protect your investment. After you've spent a significant amount of income, <laughs> on money on these veneers, you definitely want, don't want to have them fail. So you can wear this little plastic device. You wear it every night. It helps protect your teeth. So these are things that all help to work with your bite to keep your bite from being your worst enemy. After all, do you think when you chew? Of course not. We just do it as second nature. But what if we introduce a veneer that's too long and now it gets in the way of this subconscious chewing cycle that we have, then we can have a disaster. And while you're sleeping, do you know what you're doing with your teeth? Of course you don't, you're asleep. So you wanna have something that can protect your veneers while you're sleeping. And then finally, and probably the most difficult one for me to actually talk about, is that dentists need special training. We just can't learn veneers by watching a YouTube video or by reading a book or by listening to a couple lectures in dental school. You need to go beyond that. And you know, we talked about multiple factors that, that determine success. There's the patient, where we need to make sure that it's the right procedure, that the patient has a reasonable expectation, and that you understand the veneers are not inexpensive. They are one of the most costly things we do in dentistry, and for good reason. They take a lot of effort. We need to understand that the technology is really critical. We do digital smile design. We use cameras to communicate information to our laboratories. We use high magnification when we're performing our procedures. Absolutely critical. Another thing that's critical is that we use the right materials. We use the best ceramics, the best adhesives to bond them to the tooth structure, the best cements, cements the best tints and opaques and things like this to give ourselves the best surgical result. We also have to remember that the laboratory has to be dialed in to your digital smile design. Digital smile design is our way of communicating what's potential, what the potential is of the result to the laboratory and be on the same page. So we're working off blueprints rather than guessing what the final result will look like. We have to have really good lab support, really good master dental technicians to perform veneers well. When it comes to the practice of the dentist, if you go in to see a dentist for veneers, you should never feel rushed. This is a procedure that takes time and takes a lot of focus. The dentist is leaving the operatory many times to go look at other patients coming back to you. That's probably not the right situation to be in to get veneers. Veneers require a dentist that has taken on the following commitment, no compromises. I'm going to take whatever time it needs to make this case amazing. And then finally, the dentist. The dentist has got to have this commitment. They've got to have passion. And they have to have developed the right skill. And skill does not come automatically. Skill is a learned practice response. It's that way for Tiger Woods. It's that way for LeBron James. They all must practice. We in dent as dentists need to practice as well just like a musician would have to practice, a singer, or any craftsman that has to use their hands. Of all of these factors, do you know the most important one? It's the dentist. The dentist, that's the key. Studies have shown that veneers are not going to have survival rates like we've talked about over a 10 year period, only 53% survival rate in this study. The this, this study evaluated the veneers that were done by general dentists and found that the reason why 
they, they didn't last long it's because these dentists didn't have adequate training. Okay? Another study looking at the dentist as a factor in the success of the veneers found that when you had dental students of veneers perform the veneers, they were only getting 47% success rate at seven years. This is pretty alarming. And it just, it really boils down to the following. You've got to train yourself, your brain and your hands, to the highest level if you want to make veneers to last 95% at 20 years. That's all there is to it. If you look at the veneer case flow, we have five visits that we perform in our practice. And I'm teaching courses that tell dentists that the only way to do veneers predictably is with at least five visits. And I've outlined them here. You can see that each one of these columns represents a significant amount of effort on the part of the dentist. And a lot of training is involved. This is going to involve not only the team, of your dental office, the technology, the laboratory, the patient's got to play their role, the dental technicians has got to be dialed into the preciseness of the case, and the dentist should be using the best possible materials that they can. We use the latest technology today. We scan our patients. We're able to digitally capture all of the information and send that to the laboratory. We're able to look at an original photograph and overlay this digital information and provide a digital smile design analysis for what the case could look like. Like here, where this patient was just only having their bicuspid and canine teeth replaced with veneers, not their front teeth. Those were old veneers performed by another dentist, actually quite well many years ago, over 20 years ago, by the way. And we just wanted to have these little veneers done on the side, but the simulation can then lead to the reality. So look here, you see that on the left and on the right, you have these teeth are discolored, they don't blend into the existing smile very well, and we can perform veneers on these after the veneers were done. Uh, you can see the photograph, how much of a huge change this was. So before veneers, and then after veneers, you can see the veneers can be done really, really well because they correlate back to the digital smile design that we're showing here. All of this has to be built into the practice workflow. There really is no easy way to do veneers in a practice without incorporating digital technology. So we know that there are many advantages, translucency, natural appearance, conservation of tooth structure, predictable enamel bond, aesthetic stability, proven longevity if done well. But remember, they're irreversible. They're highly technique sensitive. They cost a lot. Fractures can happen if the bite is not managed properly. Recession can happen if the tissue is not understood and managed properly. And we can have stained edges around the veneers in a short period of time. The dentist doesn't understand the ultimate proven techniques for how to bond the veneers to the tooth structure. So if you have old, ugly bonding, can veneers make you look better? Absolutely. Veneers can be a miracle solution, but you have to make sure you choose wisely. You know, it's come down to this. We, as consumers of healthcare, must be our own advocate to get the finest dentistry that we want. So to review, the five things you need to know about porcelain or ceramic veneers is they're not reversible, they don't last forever, they're not a cure for other smile issues. Your bite is key, right? And then finally, the dentist needs to have special training. And is it wrong for you to ask them where they got their training? Absolutely not. Hope you have a great day. Thanks for spending a few minutes with us here at Stevenson Dental Solutions.